it's a good thing. Now I've come to talk about my host. And I thank Michael Feinberg. He gave me a wonderful day today, and I got to see things that I was very, very impressed by. Everyone agrees, I think, that Kip does wonderful work. It's taken you 16 years to create nearly 100 schools. I think you have 99 now. And with the $50 million that you just won from the federal government, the number of your schools will certainly increase. And you'll be challenged to maintain your quality as you grow more schools. Uh, today, there are as I said before, 5,000 charter schools in the Obama administration is determined to see that that number grows very rapidly. Uh, hundreds and perhaps thousands of new charters of very different quality and competence are going to spring up across the nation in the next few years, and we'll see whether rapid growth is a good thing. And you did not grow rapidly, and I think that was very wise. So the question is about, <laughs> about charters, is deregulation the answer to the, Ill the ills of American education? So let me give you a few examples of some of the problems. I think it's the current issue of Newsweek magazine, either the current one or the one before, has a story about the charters in New Orleans and how they exclude and suspend special education students at incredible rates. And the article asked, is the New Orleans success story made possible by exclusion of the children with the greatest needs? That's an important issue. Uh, Ross Global Academy in New York City was founded by the widow of a media mogul, the man who created Time Warner, and it's been celebrated in stories in the national media. It's now gone through six principals in five years, incredibly high teacher turnover, high student attrition. It's now the worst rated elementary and middle school in New York City. The other day I got an email from the principal of a middle school in Los Angeles, it's called Audubon Middle School. Dr. Davis said to me that the local charter schools were dumping their lowest performing students to his school in the middle of the year. And he wrote, quote, since the school began, we enrolled 159 new 7th and 8th grade students. Of the 159 new students, 102 were the very low performing students who were sent from the charter schools. And he said, it is ridiculous that they can pick and choose kids and pretend that they're raising scores. And in fact, they're purging non-performing students at an alarming rate that's how they're raising their scores, not by improving the performance of these students. Such a large number of far below basic FBB students will handicap the growth that the Audubon staff initiated this year and will negatively impact our school's overall scores as we continue to receive a recurring tide of low-performing students. That is a charter chain called ICEF in Los Angeles that just went bankrupt last week. It has one of the largest chains in the country gets very good results, went bankrupt, it's now close to, and it was just salvaged by emergency donations of almost a million dollars from local foundations. Uh, Professor Ed Fuller of University of Texas wrote me the other day, and he said in Texas we have only a couple of dozen of our 300 charter schools that are rated high performing. Most are incredibly low performing and do far worse than predicted based on prior scores and lose the majority of their students over time. Uh, a couple of months ago, a principal in Los Angeles was accused by auditors of stealing over a million dollars. Actually, the school has $2.7 million missing, and they're still trying to find the money. They found all kinds of, of vouchers made out to non-existent companies. And then there's the question, which nobody has really wrestled with very much. What about the charters that blur the line between church and state? The Hebrew language charters, the Arabic charters, the charters run by churches. They're proliferating. Uh, there's a website now called Charter School Scandals, all one word, created by an Oakland parent to monitor the misdeeds and the sleaze and the corruption of many of these charters. So what I want to say to Kip, because I really, really admire what you're doing, is you have an excellent reputation. You get great results. Thousands of new charters will be created in the wake of your success, but your results are not typical. Warren, President Obama, Secretary Duncan. You want to go down in history as the exemplar that opened the door to a near, new era of deregulation, greed, and malpractice? Get out in front, defend your integrity by explaining to the media that the wonderful results you get are unusual. They're not typical of the charter se sector. You must disassociate yourself from the educational robber barons, dilettantes, and incompetents who are following in your wake, making false promises of delivering a low-quality education to poor and minority children.
Charter schools should not be exempt from civil rights laws. Charter schools should not exclude or counsel out the neediest students. Charter schools should aggressively seek out and recruit the students most in need and not wait for them to find you. The original purpose of charter schools, which were the idea came in 1988 from the president of the American Federation of Teachers, Albert Shanker, and his idea was charter schools would exist to seek out and help the neediest students. And it's because of high stakes testing the charter schools and because of the, the whole business venture part of charters that they are incentivized to avoid those students. Now, having thrown my compliments all over Kip, I will now turn to TFA. <laughs> you can't wait, can you? <laughs> if I were just graduating from college, which I wish were true, <laughs> I would surely want to join Teach for America. I understand why tens of thousands of idealistic college students sign up for a two-year term as a teacher in a school serving poor students. I've met many, many young people who are in TFA now, and I've been impressed by their intelligence, their enthusiasm, their sincerity, and their dedication. But I would urge you, please stop claiming that TFA will close the achievement gap. That may be a nice slogan, but no one can teach for two or three years and close the achievement gap. <laughs> Closing the achievement gap requires a lot more than really smart and dedicated young people with five weeks of training and a lot of enthusiasm. It requires highly skilled career professionals with deep experience who are willing to stick to the profession. I'm sure that many of your at least some of your core members, maybe many, will remain and become those kinds of professionals. But for now, you send out a false message that your core of young people is all that it takes, and that's not true. The TFA message is supporting efforts to undercut professionalism in every part of education. Not only do we now have superintendents who are never educators, but now we have many programs to train non-educators to be principals. TFA supposedly proved that no professionalism was needed, just really smart people. So now we have George W. Bush Institute aligned with TFA, planning to train 50,000 new principals over the next decade, many of them drawn from business, the military, sports, and other non-educational fields. Uh, as I was driving into Houston yesterday, uh, my brother pointed out to me a billboard that said, TexasTeachers.org, want to be a teacher? So as we're driving past, I went to my cell phone, and I see, gosh, all you have to do is put down $395, and you can, you're on your way to being certified. Does TFA want to be remembered in history as the leading edge of a movement to destroy the education profession? Is that what your epitaph will say someday? Last year, the Wall Street Journal published an article called Heal for America, written by Dr. William B. oddly enough, Healy. He's a clinical professor of surgery at the University of Texas. And he said that the medical profession should emulate the success of TFA. And in his proposal, members of Heal for America would perform such chores as improving cleanliness in homes and helping patients with their personal hygiene. HFA would teach patients how to wash their hands and would explain the importance of getting a good night's sleep, exercising, and eating proper foods. They would be able to take a pulse, check blood pressure, and take the temperature. And he wrote, and I quote in the Wall Street Journal, of course, the members of this program would not try to be amateur physicians or physician's assistants or substitute registered nurses. Dr. Healy did not see Heal for America as a substitute for real professionals, but as helpers to real professionals. But TFA says that its core members, fresh out of college with five weeks training, are ready to be full-time teachers and not classroom helpers. TFA is akin to the Peace Corps. The members of the Peace Corps do very valuable work. They're sent to distant lands to help address local problems, to dig, to dig wells, to build schools, to do whatever is needed. But no one suggests that they should take the place of professional diplomats. No one believes that the Peace Corps should replace the Foreign Service. So my message to my host, and forgive me if I didn't go, is practice humility. I know that's hard to do. I know that 
It's hard to do when the media adores you, foundations shower millions on you, and the federal government drops $50 million on you. It's hard to keep your perspective under these circumstances. We would all wish to be in these circumstances. But try to remember the old adage, pride goeth before a fall. Problems of American education will not be solved by deregulation, nor will the achievement gap be closed by people who come to work for two or three years. If we look to Finland, we find a very different